Hi, welcome to SIARC. Um, I mean, that welcome to SIARC is just a formality. I think most of the people are from SIARC, so anyway. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Oliver Lang. Um, I met Oliver Lang in weird circumstances in Buenos Aires, like four or five years ago. And Oliver is a kind of a interesting hybrid. Uh, it was uh, this weird moment in Buenos Aires, this German guy speaking to me in Spanish. So that was, it's not that the information is that relevant, it's just to prove um, some of the experience and different research that Oliver has been conducting all over the place. Um, Oliver is part what I will call a second wave of designers came out of Columbia University in the middle of the 90s. And what is interesting about some of these characters of the second wave is that Oliver work, uh, he, he tried to take a position um, as a hybrid condition between like the two extreme tendencies that have been dominating the discourse in architecture for the last 30 and 40 years. The one is based in pure autonomy and technique elaboration of form, and the one that tried to negotiate with external for forces and external condition to give shape. I think the, the work of Oliver through his office LWPAC and his different research as a faculty at the University of Par Valparaíso in Chile and right now in SIAC and also in the University of British Columbia in, in Canada has been proved and, and I think a clear expression of desire working towards to this, I wouldn't call it a new paradigm, but certainly to try to take a different position. In that sense, for me, his work is one of the most clear evidence of this model of hybridization. Uh, certainly, he's not alone, but for sure, he's one of the leaders of that tendency. So it's my pleasure to welcome Oliver Lang to SIAC. Uh, thank you, Anand, for the kind words. I hope this works here. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and even in his absence, I'd really like to thank uh, Michael Speaks and uh, Ming as well for inviting me um, to teach this term here as well, which has been really an outstanding experience um, with the students. And um, as always, I've, I've learned a lot from the students, probably more than they've learned from me. Um, I'd like to uh, start with a little bit more of an introduction about myself. Not so much talking about what I did, but what I was exposed to and what I was trying to get at. Um, I, starting architecture uh, school in Germany, Um, starting architecture school in Germany um, made me fairly quickly realize that there was a certain perception uh, about what architecture is, how it should be practiced, um, what the relevant issues are, and um, it was very technical. Um, design was very much uh, driven by solutions thinking, and um, I wanted to see what other positions were out there, and I moved to uh, to Barcelona to study there with uh, Enrique Mirais. And the most interesting thing in this, despite studying at the at the ADSAP, which was fantastic, was really to simply see how the same thing has different meaning in a different culture, um, and look at the different kind of cultural practices in Spain, um, and starting to compare them in Germany and by living there not just being a tourist and, and doing a quick kind of experience shopping but actually living there and being immersed in the culture itself um, only then I started to realize that the for me the, the one driving force in my own work and research is really that kind of moment of, of difference um, <clears throat> so a, a second realization happened was that uh, the evolution of the city itself, the way how architecture relates to it, um, is something that we can try to plan to a certain extent, but it also depends hugely on certain historical events, um, like in Barcelona, the end of the Franco regime, and um, then Spain becoming 
part of the European Union. Um, that paired with Barcelona uh, being the host of the Olympics in 1992 sparked in a kind of enormous discussion and, and change and growth that completely transformed the city uh, in, in its nature and that nobody, I think, like it happened, could have anticipated and changed the urban fabric. Um, further then, I, the wall came down all of a sudden in Germany and uh, so I went back to Berlin to see what was happening there and uh, of course it was a, again a fairly dramatic change um, in the overall cultural environment and political reality and um, <clears throat> to see again what kind of methods people were trying out in that moment, what they were you know, heavily leaning in the case of, of Berlin on, the, on, the, on, on history basically because they had no grounds to stand on, they didn't know where to go from there and how to take advantage of that opportunity, um, showed to me that uh, the, the way how we're actually working as designers um, as driving towards a kind of solution was something that's supposed to be implemented for 20, 30, 50 or even longer, more years than that didn't really seem to work. You know, there, there was this first thought that uh, a piece of architecture, by the time it's, it's conceived, or the first thought um, has been had about it until it was actually implemented. Um, within those years, the changes had somehow made, the, made projects fairly quickly obsolete. Um, moving, moving on to New York and seeing New York itself transforming itself to um, I think what it wanted to be for a long time, but not just the kind of cultural capital, but also the kind of um, economic changes that happened and the kind of restructuring, even though the fabric, there wasn't much building going on, but the kind of restructuring of the, the kind of programmatic territories in the city were tremendous. And then the, the probably one of the most significant experience that, that I've had was uh, when then after graduating from Columbia, I was invited to teach at an architecture school in in Valparaiso for, for many years and um, seeing really again how people were really engaging with their urban fabric in, a, in again it was the end of the Pinochet regime and so that was very interesting for me to again see this transformational process there um, and how that relates back to culture and then I moved myself to, to Vancouver to stay in North America on the one side but also to understand more about um, Asia overall. Um, I guess if somebody would have said 15 years ago, oh, I've tried to be in many places, people would have thought you try to be pretentious, but this, I think today, it's really just part of our everyday being and research that we live in one place and we're, we're practicing wherever uh, an interesting field emerges or uh, some interesting adjacencies to our field or opportunities simply arise. So this lecture really does not attempt to give any answers uh, or to provide any kind of recipes. I don't have any recipes so far. Our practice is really just evolving over the years. And rather, it attempts to raise some questions, and I, I believe in each question, maybe there is a part of an answer or an interest already in it, um, that I believe architecture should be confronted with. I will try to take you on a little journey into about a dozen fragments of my research and practice to illustrate some of my concerns. Further, I will seek to explore the potential mutual benefits that professional architectural practice and interdisciplinary design research can obtain if they are understood as fundamentally interrelated and accordingly executed in a co-evolutionary fashion. And this issue of co-evolution has been really the kind of heart of our practice to see um, how is the relationship of practice, research, and uh, how do they relate to each other, how do they inform each other, me being a kind of teacher slash researcher slash practitioner, um, I couldn't really practice without researching or teaching, and I couldn't really teach without practicing. And so for me, they're, they're fundamentally interrelated in which a kind of hypothesis is created somewhere. It's been tested either in the design studio, or it's been tested in, the, uh, in, the, um, in, in our office. And that sparks more research, um, which then feeds back. And so the notion of feedback as something that then ultimately can drive the evolution of intelligence is, I think, what I really like to talk about uh, tonight. Another co-evolution that uh, I'm very curious about is what I mentioned before, the, the kind of fairly dramatic urban transformations that we can see, but architecture being always being conceived as something fairly static within it. And so how can we deal with an architecture um, that in itself has to adapt to 
transformational processes. And just to give you a little example here, and we could probably pull up hundreds of these comparisons. But on the right hand side, you see Hong Kong in 1950, Hong Kong in 2000, and uh, the big construction site in front of it here is already filled by now while we are speaking with another two 800 foot towers. Um, and you can see not long ago here, Norman Foster's Hong Kong Shanghai Bank was one of the tallest buildings with a lot of presence in the context and slowly it gets kind of, uh, it starts to disappear in the context. They're similar with the Woolworth building in New York when you look at it and once it, it was, you know, had tremendous presence and now it's just a, uh, somehow relating back to old times. So what if the urban environment is in a constant process of change and transformation. The cultural practices are in a constant process of change and transformation. How can we respond to it as architects when we're trying to build something that uh, supposedly is to be around for a while and has some value also in its kind of longevity? So there's three three issues I think in in, in our thinking that's important for us is the, the urban fabric, the architecture, and then the practice models themselves. Um, and give you kind of a hypothesis that by now, it's a few years old actually, but it's still something that, that we're interested in and it will evolve, I think, overall after a few years once we've reached a kind of first moment or milestone of, of research. Um, context. Urban culture has become increasingly complex for the process of design and the architectural intervention. Progressively challenged by the impact of technological innovations, global network economies and cultural interdependencies, architecture today is more than ever inextricably woven into the dynamic multiplicities of this context. Emergence, which relates to architecture itself. While the physical elements of architecture remain to be static by nature, its inherent actions, relations, and conditions are in a constant flux and have become largely unpredictable. In today's architectural discourse, the ideas of chance, change, vicissitude, potentiality, interdependency, temporality, and performance have now either replaced or at least coexist with the former preoccupations of form, substance, permanence, and language. Caused by the optimization, hybridization, and convergence of both building programs and lifestyles, Emerging building typologies have become virtually interchangeable while live, work, and leisure activities are now in many ways indistinguishable. Practice. The profession of the architect is going through a paradigmatic shift from being a solutions provider to an interdisciplinary design consultant. Ideation, speculative visions, research, and scenario studies are today as much part of everyday design practice as are Sorry, I'm going to flip the right picture. Integration of intelligent agents and composite materials or robotic construction, mass customization, marketing or branding models, differential media, or subversive art. Now, with its relation to practice, one issue came to my mind when I talked, uh, had the, the great opportunity to meet with some uh, fairly uh, important developers and then the CEO of the China Club uh, in the China Club in Hong Kong a few years ago and they basically just looked at me and said Oliver you know we don't consider architecture to be a professional service anymore we don't really need any architects we have it all figured out we know how to build towers we have our engineers we know the ideal floor plans we know the economical models behind them and we need you to really just put a face onto the building and design the lobby and um, so I was starting to wonder, where's actually the value of, of what we're trying to contribute? How can we start to relate, not just to a kind of intrinsic discourse about architecture that relates to its own making of form and language, syntax, production techniques and so forth, but it's always within, within itself. How can we actually start to engage with the notion that a lot of people out there don't really understand what we're doing all day long and, and don't see the value in it? So. <clears throat> Then we were wondering what kind of design operations can be invented that have the capacity to both mediate within this complex context and to potentiate the ideas of architectural constructs. What kind of research process need to be generated that inform these design operations in order to generate more adaptive and performative urban spaces of cultural exchange? How can we formulate open-ended and evolutionary technique, techniques that produce rigorous research and precisely formulated proposals 
while avoiding the trap of laying the foundations for isolated problem solvings? And number four, what are the potentials that are offered by digital design processes today and robotically assisted fabrication or digital, the realm of the digital overall to help us with this? Within this context, one issue I think is important for us to maybe uh, have a discussion about or what we're having all the time is really trying to come to terms with what it really means to work in, in a context of globalization. Of course, people have talked about this for many years now, um, but try to understand what are really the positions that people take in it. And, you know, even going back to, to Frederick Jameson, who has, I think, quite eloquently argued that there are four or five positions that one can take in this, one is which nothing really has changed, there is no globalization, everything happens still within the, within the locale, um, which that's probably a highly questionable position. Or you could say there was always globalization, even hundreds of years ago already people were going around the globe and trading and doing all kinds of things and, and exchanging goods and, and uh, or there's an affirmation, uh, affirmation of globalization in a world market, but current networks are only different in degree and not in kind to previous ones. Or it's simply a multinational stage of capitalism, but it doesn't really affect cultures per se. So if we look at globalization from this perspective, then what are the things that have actually really changed? And I would, I would think that it has not just changed in degree, but it actually has changed our environment and kind um, as with uh, the research that we've conducted, we've seen over and over again in many different places that yes, models are exported and imported and they've become a kind of dominant language um, everywhere. But interestingly enough, it is really the offset that the local has to offer at this moment. Like Deleuze talked once about the evolution of language and in it he basically said that the reason why language never dies and why it's not static is because they're dialects and the dialects constantly deteriorate and change the way how um, the language is and therefore it is a constant process of evolving and it becomes a kind of manifestation and a, and a tool for cultures to unfold and I think very similarly that um, this process of, of subtle differentiation um, is really where the relationship between the two come together and in um, many business schools um, for the longest time people have talked about understanding the local and catering to it and then all of a sudden it was think global, act global and I think all these positions are now being revised in something much more subtle and much more with a much greater range of grayscale to understand what are the real interactive forces in there but one of the problems in this is of course that um, the people who drive the global economy um, they're trying really to get, to get it right, but what they do within this, of course, that they still don't quite understand that the real things within it is exactly that kind of local force that differentiates the global. And so they have seen it for the longest time as just an obstacle that needs to be overcome so that models that were developed and standardized, highly standardized, could be exported anywhere in the world. But that doesn't seem to happen too well anymore, even within the last few years. I think a lot of companies, large companies like Coca-Cola and Nike and so forth, realize that they have to respond much more with much more agility um, to what's happened there. And that sparks a very interesting discussion about the whole notion of mass customization. How do you actually take a strategy? How do you take products and so forth somewhere else and have built into it a kind of intelligence that uh, allows the product to be translated, adapted, reformulated according to a local condition, global condition or local condition, yet not losing some of the things that made it actually uh, initially a very viable product. So for me, that nevertheless, the one most driving force that we can see through uh, globalization is really the, the fact that we all of a sudden can see choice emerging from this process. Um, in, in, in many, many ways of choice for uh, communication, um, where we can see almost in any country in the world people can choose their service providers, they can go hardware or they can actually start talking on a cell phone. Um, 
the whole technological infrastructure uh, is much more varied and provides from you know companies to communities uh, a much greater put a possibility to unfold the kind of entrepreneurial ideas um, the image as a kind of global language as uh, I think Sanford Quinter argued quite quite well is that that really is kind of replacement of the text within the, this, the image starts to kind of also suggest to us that we have a choice in lifestyle and we can unfold those things in, in many ways. The shift uh, from a social society to a, a, a market-driven society, the multinationals that are emerging that are now trying to um, re-territorialize the kind of globe to, to their need and uh, starting to relink themselves. So when we talked about the multinationals in, in, in the mid-90s, I think we had a very different understanding about them, what, what they're actually now. And a lot of companies actually, instead of grouping a lot of businesses, what they really try to do is find a lo lot of local expertise around the world and then link them back to, to their overall operation. Um, the, the issues of transaction, distributed global manufacturing, all these pose really challenging questions, I think, to us when we think about architecture. It's not something that's just locally made and produced and put together, but we're in any building today. You know, we get glazing systems from here, and we get plastics from there, and some steel comes from China or from wherever, we don't know. And uh, we'll have to still make it part of our design um, on an everyday um, everyday practice uh, and then emerging cultures that start to take over like tourism becoming one of the biggest industries in the world or if the, um, it's been predicted now that leisure and entertainment will even outnumber tourism but tourism and leisure and entertainment together will basically be the driving forces behind the, the global economy but choice seems to be for me the, the most dominant thing because it, it actually relates back to what people really want. It just relates back to human desire, like the same thing, like people want to talk on the phone, they want to have a choice when they can call, where they can be called, and so forth. Now the difference in, just to illustrate this a little bit more, here's some photographs by German photographer Andreas Gorski. He's, um, he's looking exactly at this issue of the kind of subtle differences. And uh, so on top we see the Frankfurt stock market, the Mercantile Exchange in Tokyo, and it's kind of the same thing, but the actual spatial practice behind it, the way how it's translated, how the spaces are organized, the flow of information, everything is completely different. And in the research that I've done with, with my students over the years, um, the one most interesting thing is always when we talk about the same thing and it means something completely different. So for example, we talk about you know, people socializing in Barcelona, they actually never meet at home, they always go out, which drives somehow the entire evening and nightlife of the city, while in other places people actually never go out, they always meet at home for dinner parties. And um, same thing with shopping, in some areas you go to Hong Kong and people shop as a social act, but they are actively shopping, while in, in uh, the parts of South America that I get to know, especially in Chile, um, the places where shopping happens become, in a way, kind of gathering places where, where, where people meet, talk, and so forth, but a lot of the actual goods are really a kind of stage, a backdrop of dreams, and so forth, and then the act of shopping itself is not, not so prevalent. <clears throat> um, if you look at the upper image, that is the... Um, do with the pointer now? Somewhere. There it is. This is the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank again, by designed by Norman Forster, and you know the, the interest in the kind of spatial practice that inserts itself if if you give people the opportunity somehow to simply read an opportunity into a space and saying, oh, we could do something there. So one of the the issues in Hong Kong is that you have thousands and thousands of of Filipino women working there, and they. Um, you know, they work in homes doing cleaning services and so forth, but they want to get together somewhere. And so they basically occupy the entire downtown of, of Hong Kong on the weekends and inhabit every single space they can find. All the, the skywalks that connect uh, on a 15 foot high level up to all these lobby spaces um, are completely taken over for barbecues, fairs, exchange, music, and so forth. And uh, 
it all comes from a model that they developed in which they said we'll just leave the the ground floor open, if you leave the ground floor open you're allowed to build a few stories more, so the actual lobby of the building is, is up above here, you have this big glass belly hanging here, and then there's the, the escalator that takes you up into it, and um, so the, the kind of spatial practice differentiating the space in itself and taking advantage of it became something um, very important, similar to here, like every moment is seen as an opportunity to set up some kind of exchange and trade in relationship to traffic and traffic jams and so forth in uh, these pictures taken in uh, North Africa. Now, <coughs> back to the issue of in the process of globalization that the, the, the multinationals have really tried to um, come up with this model of standardization um, that is exportable, what, what is really the outfall from it? And um, here's a little quote from J.G. Ballard, um, wherever there is a vacuum, the wrong kind of politics creep in, look at the century ahead, an upholstered desert, but a wasteland all the same. And I think in many ways, even though this is from a fiction, um, the notion that we as architects and uh, people concerned about, I think, the, the way how architecture operates and looks and so forth have not actually engaged with many of these issues um, over the last 25 years and rather looked at a kind of intrinsic form of architecture where everything is about architecture in itself and syntax and, and issues of form, preoccupations of you know, spatial organization and so forth, but it was always very much a discourse within itself and therefore that the issue that the kind of wrong kind of politics are kind of creeping in and are taken over by developers that then say architecture has no more value, I think it's a still a kind of deeply concerning issue that uh, we're with our practice trying to somehow find ways to engage with it and talk about um, the issue of what is actually value and what does it mean to have a project that's successful, how can you get to that what we're maybe all interested in is to really create a kind of innovative architecture but uh, from there um, I think we have to maybe step back and look at it a little bit closer so this uh, little story here we run things years ago people took for granted that the future meant more leisure this is true for the less skilled and less able those who are not net contributors to society poets traffic wardens ecologists for the talented and ambitious the future means work not play no recreation at all, only a special kind. Workers where they find their real fulfillment, running an investment bank, designing an airport, bringing on a stream of new family of anti antibiotics, antibiotics. If their work is satisfying people, don't need, they don't need leisure in the old-fashioned sense. No one ever asked what Newton or Darwin did to relax or how Bach spent his weekend. At Eden Olympia, work is the ultimate play and play is the ultimate work. Eden Olympia is a kind of fictional um, village or town research center in southern France in this fiction. There's one thing missing. All I see are a lot of office buildings and car parks and a faked up landscape where the moral compass is bearings that hold everything together they fall away. A giant multinational like Fuji and General Motors sets its own morality. The company defines the rules that govern and have engineered in a sensible response curve. We can rely on their judgment and that leaves us free to get on with our lives. And in many ways I think that's what we're seeing right now with franchising and so forth uh, taking over. So the question is, where is the limitation that I think how, how does this all happen? Why is it that we, as architects, seemingly can't find a way to engage with this differently and um, try to invest something in which we can actually show that there is a different way of going and that there's value in, in contributing with something much more complex and not so profane? The main issue for me is in the relationship between the concept and the idea. <clears throat> the history of architecture has always been looked at as through concepts and limited, discusses, limited discussions of discourses of representation. Concepts are preserved within implied limits of qualitative and quantitative variation of rep representation. Limits are caused by identity, opposition in reference to, analogies through conflict, 
resemblance in perception and illogical visions of a priori or empirical concepts. Concepts operate with effects and concepts only designate possibilities. And that, of course, works perfectly in, 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 in a world where we communicate through images, where everything has to be extremely reduced, has to be quick in order to communicate it. Um, but it is not evolutionary, it's static, and it's uh, about a reference to something that is already known. So how can you, within this, create a kind of evolution and innovation? And I would argue for a process that really engages with the notion of the idea. Because ideas are related to the cause. They imply virtual or potential multiplicities. Ideas are open-ended and ideas are incomplete. And that's, in our work, actually, has become very important to, to introduce this notion of incompleteness. Ideas are, ideas are in a process. They're not an end to something, but it's ongoing. They operate by condensating the information of singularities and unpredictable becomings. They require progressive determination in the linkage of initial and adjacent fields. And with progressive determination, I mean that, they, that we actually take a position in our idea, and we don't have to be worried that we would lock ourselves down because we know we're creating a process in which feedbacks are integrated in this and therefore a kind of process of continuous differentiation can start to happen and I try, I hope I can show that in some of the projects. Ideas become operational methods in which systems are continuously transformed through varying degrees of stimuli. They are basically open-ended feedback loops and if we would operate with them as this, what I'm proposing, implies, it would really require a kind of non, very non-linear approach. It's accessible. It could be started from any given point. You don't have to say, you have to start at the urban, move to the architecture, you have to start at the architecture, move to the urban. You could start at the entrance of a building. You could start with a set of data. It doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, it's all a way of how you bring this together um, and then keep basically as many of the balls up in the air as, as long as possible and extract information from this continuously. Intelligence then, to give it some definition in this, is very, very important because it's the capacity to evaluate, adapt, and change. And if we would argue that the cities change constantly and that change is the driving force and that change is the one thing that makes also our, somehow as, as uh, Ram has argued, that it's the kind of paradox of architecture that we constantly have to project into the future but we don't know the future and we can't anticipate it. But what we can do is we can try to think about some issues that are actually value issues within society, within culture, that are fairly permanent and that keep on coming back. The fact that people want to be social, I mean, that's, uh, or that people want to communicate, I think we all know that that is a, is a very permanent force. But what we don't know is how they actually do it. Um, so for, our, for us, the capacity to evaluate information um, is something that, that needs to be built and uh, that is not something that emerges over, overnight. Um, to adapt and to change then is that feedback process in, in itself. Um, and the same thing, I would think, I'm not trying to argue for buildings that are intelligent that can constantly change, but maybe something in which buildings have the capacity in which people can reevaluate what they find, where they're not engaging a kind of universal condition, but conditions that are actually quite specific, but in their differentiation have uh, multiple access points in themselves. So what I'd like to give you is our interpretation of design intelligence at this moment, and again, this is an ever-evolving thing, but I have four points here. Intelligence is a generate generating knowledge raising question through, um, sorry, intelligence is generating knowledge raising questions through research and scenario studies about context and cultural conditions and practices to link the present to possible, to possible futures. And it's not trying to find the answer of the future but thinking about possible futures to basically help us kind of brainstorm through some scenarios. Intelligence for the design process or for an intelligent practice in itself develop an agility to the ever-changing project parameters in conjunction with marketing strategies. Intelligent buildings, making buildings more responsive or give the capacity for them to be more interpretive. This can happen in a twofold way. 
distributed difference that catalyzes different practices or making architecture an interpretive challenge. Or B, design as a platform to which added are specific components and temporal aspects. And the last number four would deal with intelligent, intelligent fabrication in which mass customization, distribution, and assembly in global networks, rapid prototyping, research, and material science, and so forth are linked. So basically, when, when we started to look at this, we started to realize that we have the wrong tools. We're looking at our environment in a very limited way. We're looking at our own profession in a very limited way. Um, and uh, we're also somehow really not engaging with the actual potential that buildings have to contribute to the urban environment overall. And that was actually a, a, a bit um, overwhelming at a moment some, some years ago. I think, how can we deal with this if we have to somehow retool ourselves and retool the field almost on all fronts? Um, <clears throat> and so what we've decided for ourselves that we would kind of take a kind of step-by-step -step approach where we take certain aspects and wherever there's a possibility, we will try to test it, feed it back, test it in the next project, feed it back, and so forth. Um, the, the issue of actual implementation became really important to us um, because we thought we could never actually really find out what the value of our discussion is if we are not trying to implement them in some form or another. So it really changed the practice that we had just started in which we had certain assumptions about how it should be done from the beginning of its entirety and, and ever since um, it's, it's constantly evolving. So one item back to the issue of practice was simply the way how we think and draw and um, I find interesting enough that the, the image on the left here by um, Busotti is uh, the image on the, on the second page cover of uh, A Thousand Plateaus and what this really is is a way of redoing a, a notational system for music that is all about feedback processes between the different players. That they're all different players and they all play one larger thing, one larger uh, song or uh, over and every single time feedback has to be created and not a single one of these instruments can just simply look at itself. It has to see itself in, in the adjacency condition that is there and of course on the right hand side um, John Cage, uh, you know, kind of instruction to allow for this kind of very open-ended and incomplete process in which something unfolds and it's different every single time it comes out of it. So the notion for us to, to think and diagram and, and draw uh, somehow brought some issues that some of which are very simplistic, like here the new notational systems that were developed by Karl Heinz Stockhausen, um, simply to kind of engage with ideas of volume, uh, volume fields, pitch, and so forth, and music, and drive it simply from there. And because there was no way of drawing this before, he had to reinvent his own system. Um, similar here from Rudolf Laban, Laban notation. There was not a good way, uh, some, uh, I think he said 1925, if I'm not mistaken, um, to actually draw a dance in relationship to the body, in relationship to space and stages and so forth. Um, it was always drawn with the kind of just the tapping and the steps, but not with the whole relationship that the body had in the space itself. And so Lavin had to reinvent the idea of drawing, um, <clears throat> which he did. Um, and then this notion of feedback. And for me, the one thing that uh, is maybe very much of what, what we're trying to do here is symbolically shown in the work of, of Jackson Pollock, but there is something in which knowledge is actually discovered. Something happens, it's, it's what I meant with this entry point, it doesn't really matter where it's coming from, but a kind of knowledge about a certain act or intervention starts to emerge in which on the first he just drips the paint and then he goes over it, he goes back and he sees what he's done in the first place and somehow the movement of the arm and the, the um, specific aspects of the paint, the way how it drips, um, a certain kind of syntax starts to emerge that then gets more and more embedded into the image. And when you, when you carefully study Pollock's drawings, they have actually a very strong syntax that is related back to this. So there's something in which the invention can really come out of the process itself every single time. And then there's also simply the way of, this is a drawing by Chumi, in which uh, spaces are simply not drawn 
or diagrams are not read as form, but they're actually read as something that informs the making of space. And so here, the, 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 one of the primary concerns was to create these fields for lighting, circulation, projections, and so forth, that then inform the overall space. <coughs> So here is one, one project that then we kind of started with. And so this is a few years old by now, and um, many issues to, uh, to discuss about this probably, but what was interesting for us here was we were, we were participating in a competition in Dallas where they asked in the brief to come up with a new node point that was a subway, um, a memorial for 10,000 workers who actually built a new massive uh, interstate there, um, a tram station, shopping, and so forth. And the brief said very clearly that the political forces are competing very hard and it's very unclear of what will actually come from it. And so we thought, why, why should we even bother to propose a building? What we really need to propose is something in which there is a way in which information, research, and so forth can actually be managed. And so we developed these kind of notational systems, or differential notational systems as we called them, that were basically just looking at all these different perspectives that you give to it and what that could mean for the space itself and, and proposed this as a kind of nonlinear strategy in which then certain items, you know, were saying what are all the kind of participating forces, what relationship do they have? And that was linked then to this model on the right hand side, which was not architectural form, but basically these kind of information clouds that would just simply show what would happen if you prioritize this over this and what as what effect would that have on space, on the kind of spatial practices that could emerge from this. Um, here are a few examples and of course you know a lot of these things we've seen before, but these for us are really never meant to actually make actual form. They're really just meant as basis for discussion in which we simply create a range of possibilities for it and saying, what would that mean if we let certain items basically play each other off? How would the impact, what would be the implications on uh, the way how the architecture itself could emerge? And to show that a little further, this is actually a, a project of a student of mine, but I thought she's actually a a quite terrific job to show that often we actually see these things as propositions these days that you know somebody makes a very complex form but she deliberately developed this whole thing as a kind of informational system this is only made to inform the actual architecture which is in many ways much simpler and much more rationalized but there's a feedback process between these two that allowed her to actually have a much higher degree of complexity of discussion in this because she didn't have to constantly worry that in the translation to form and building, um, a lot of the richness of this dis discussion would actually get lost and the idea uh, or the interest in form would maybe start to, to dominate it and at the end erase a lot of the opportunities that were there. So here, this is a kind of co-evolution between a completely invented notational system and then an emerging piece of architecture that came from it. Um, similar to this here, uh, idea for uh, work in, done in Chile where it was about somehow understanding the relationship between a uh, new highway system and new important points that would immediately emerge along this new highway system and how actually in every single time uh, the kind of priorities within this for the spatial organization would change. So again, the interest was not in creating just one solution, but really, first of all, this was a method of design research to find out what these things could even be about. And then step by step translating those into spatial models with all their range and variations and so forth. Now from this we try to kind of become more systematic about this process overall um, in, in developing the kind of scenario planning approach and saying how and where could we start and as I said you could start you can start from up here with criteria about a very small aspect of it and move to the larger issues the larger urban or conceptual issues um, but breaking it down in something in which feedback processes are basically first 
planned out and designed, and then even these maps change over time in each design process itself. But this gives us the possibility to really see the full picture of the project on all scales and, and try to be very articulate about what the issues and the criteria are. And then we can go back with our clients and talk to this and fine tune these and actually set priorities within the design process itself that often really uh, our clients, when we realize at the beginning of a project, they don't even know what their priorities are. So in the project, one of the first projects that we actually built, the, the notion of incompleteness became very important to us uh, as something, you know, very much inspired by uh, Solovit sculptures here where by simply subtracting from the cube and leave it open-ended an enormous amount of possibility seems to emerge in variation from it as to thinking that if other people would have to somehow complete this, what would they make from this? And some are removing our authorship a little bit from this process and saying if it's a, this is a proposal for a, or a building for a new architecture school and we were very interested somehow giving the, the architecture students and the faculty the possibility to have a building that they can actually work with and constantly transform. And this, uh, happened simultaneously with the kind of transformation of Valparaiso itself. Here in this map, you see that that's the old relationship. That was Santiago, that's Valparaiso. And what happened over the years was something in which Valparaiso, of being the most important harbor in the area, step by step uh, gets shifted um, where the harbor moved up the coast um, into a container and petroleum. Um, where its, its primary functions more and more disappeared into something where ultimately it gets kind of absorbed by a, a leisure space and therefore also changed the nature of the campus where we were supposed to build, which was right on a cliff in the center here, at the edge of the center of Valparaiso, um, in, in, in its entirety. And uh, we were confronted with something where um, the, there was a, a conflict in the university itself. The campus is UN heritage protected. Um, no building has ever had a different architecture for 65 years. And of course the architecture school wanted something somewhat contemporary. And um, so I'll, I'll show this in a moment how we then responded to this. So back to the notion of people actually interacting with the space itself. We went back to some of the collaboration that John Cage and Morris Cunningham um, did <clears throat> at the coming out of the, the Black Mountain College where everything was really about the kind of interrelationship between making the space, um, the, the set, and then the actual kind of performance in this case or the kind of cultural practice that we were interested in that could happen within the space. And developed very simple, in this case, diagrams. We realized that some of the diagrams that we started to do before were actually just too complex, but some of which started to simply show, we made a whole range of these, what kind of possible interactions, what territories of studio spaces and what kind of breakages of these could occur and you know, they become more complex and then they were boiled down again and those were actually used then to have a discussion with the faculty, the students, the university presidency, etc. to translate these diagrams into basically some very simple uh, shapes that then would, you know, enclosure, filtering and light, uh, sun control, certain spaces that would allow performances to um, occur for exhibitions, um, seeing this very much as a kind of piece of infrastructure being inserted, um, the roof itself being an amphitheater, um, and then the whole slope was a very simple thing. Here was the main patio of the campus, and the university president told us, well, the big problem is we don't want to see any contemporary building. And then we said, great, so we'll just design an angle here so that no matter where on the main patio you can see it, what he forgot about this when he approved the building is that the main entrance is right from this side, so you see that whole face here anyways. But they were happy at the end, and so the whole design is, is basically that kind of interaction of possibilities in here that then is simply wrapped into the, the, the kind of reality and political discussion that was happening on the campus itself. But it created a space well, so this is basically the piece that was added on top of the roof. We opened up the front here to make these studios all part of the, the overall building itself, and then looking at the activation of the roofs themselves. Um, the circulation was pushed on the outside. One of the challenges was that 
it was it's all earthquake zone and it's this little fragile little building on top of it and so the structure we had to design the structure that it would actually in itself have no moment forces introducing on the base here um, so that the load could actually be held up and then it was designed to also kind of control solar gain on the side this ramp going up here is a brisole <clears throat> and so you end up with a space that basically on its interior as is and if it's very specific on the one end to kind of serve as a studio as a lighting device and have the the structure being coordinated with these with these diagrams to allow for suspending elements and uh, using this platform for example for uh, for lighting and projection in, in events and um, yeah that's how it's kind of perched up on, on top of it it was really not designed it just came out of a process it came out of a an overall discussion and at the end we just said well why don't we just build this i mean it's not just a built diagram it's really the, all the different issues in a way kind of mediated came uh, into this into this building overall and um the the most exciting thing about it is really that in the meantime, I had a video about this, but I couldn't make it, I couldn't get it to work last night. Um, how the students have actually over the years now, trans, uh, on, on a continuous basis, transforming um, the space that is in there and taking advantage of it in many ways. So that every single time a studio goes in there, they install themselves, um, they build a new space within the space, and they're using it now. It's actually become the the most popular place for 5,000 people, house parties in, in Valparaiso for some reason. And the students actually use it, the school is using it as a fundraising tool to buy software and computers. Another project we worked on um, in which we were confronted with a different reality to the practice itself uh, was a project for the, the, what we ended up calling the Museum of Extreme Culture, the MOCS, where um, we were approached by a client who had an idea but didn't really know what that meant and wanted to have a, a kind of feasibility study in form of a videotape at the end together with the financial analysis of a project. Um, but all he gave us was basically a, a, a cassette with a soundtrack and said we would, we, have, we would have to design a building and animation and visualization that will actually work with the soundtrack itself. Um, this project all they wanted at the beginning was basically a tram station, which you see over here, um, and then some ideas of how you can actually convert a, a mountaintop situation to something that would be viable, not just during winter months um, in, in the mountains, but actually also in the summer for activities and so forth. And so we developed this idea of this museum that at the same time is a conference center um, in, in, in which in the sectional conditions basically programs can slide from one into the other and um, it, it's very much up to a kind of spatial management model in which how this this sectional condition at the end will be used and that was the key for us in the development with them is to bring in the possibilities um, that you could constantly shift around how the building would actually be operated with and that 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 research into this was basically at the, at the heart of it. And the rest, again, is very pragmatic as, you know, of course we're interested at the end of the day that it looks a certain way and it has certain shape and form, but really this is just kind of wrapping, shrink wrapping the, the, the different conditions from entry to the side to the underbelly of the project that uh, serves as a, uh, basically the infrastructure for this amphitheater for concerts in the summer um, and so forth. So you see the, this, this underside here is the, the, the whole cantilever is that this whole belly is basically full with fold out lighting devices and projectors and speakers and so forth that then also can provide a, a, some degree of, of control for this space on the underside of it. Um, one of the challenges where the form and the shape actually comes from, and again, it's a very simple thing in a way that um, Normally on a, on a mountaintop, this is at 2,500 meters, so that's about, about 7,500 feet elevation. Um, you get a lot of snow here, and so normally you get these pitched roofs. And so we, we said, okay, we'll have a pitched roof, but we shift it and get a skylight in here. And then the other challenge is that you can't, of course, drive a truck up there. So they told us from the beginning of the challenge was that this would have to be assembled uh, with helicopters. 
and so the, the, that started our, our research work in uh, lightweight structures, deployable structures, modern composites, and so forth, and, and much of the structure that was developed together with an engineer um, and together with um, the, a company in Switzerland that had specialized in mountaintop structures, and they, they did the whole feasibility of actually spanning those three miles free span across this valley. Um, <clears throat> And then part of this was also equally uh, the challenge that was given to us is to develop the gondola in itself for its uh, 480 people. In this case, it is actually carbon fiber with uh, uh, polycarbonate windshields in this. And um, but we had to develop it that that there was a kind of the, the control of strength and movement in the air um, was uh, very tricky because it was actually 700. 50 feet high up in the air um, above the valley floor and so the wind conditions were quite stringent and so this was then developed together with the Swiss company and they engineered in it and so at the end we had this both a feasibility study and we generated this is we generated this movie this is only a, a, a few seconds out of a 10 minute video but what became really interesting for us was the the, the whole issue that we felt for the first time we were actually producing value. The, the fact that this building was more expensive than maybe a, a very pragmatic structure in itself, we could demonstrate to the client that by him doing this investment, um, that he would actually be able to attract these conferences, um, more visitors, that that in return would allow them to um, bring in more people in the, in the hotels, which in turn created tax revenues for the village, which allowed them to build more infrastructure there for schools, etc. And so the, the, the issue that architecture actually con could make a real contribution here from a financial perspective became really interesting. So this movie was really a bit of kind of storytelling right? um, with the with the soundtrack and so forth. And Nevertheless, the, the, the great thing was, of course, that with, with digital media, you can do so many things at once. And we really did this with a small team, with incredible time pressure. Um, the whole project, we had basically six weeks for design, marketing strategy, development, engineering, and so forth. And using the digital media as a kind of key tool in which the design was done, at the same, in the visualization that the, the, the were done at the same time, we could make these uh, 3D files. We emailed them to to Boston. Um, they brought us back a 3D model that we could show to the client. At the same time, we could fire this off to the people in Switzerland. They could start doing some engineering and some of the the panels. Our engineer could work on it. Everybody could work on it at the same time. And so, really, it wasn't this kind of linear process in which we designed and passed it on from day one. It was basically all players on the table and. The, all the feedback uh, was brought into the project every three days, and it evolved very, very quickly from that discussion. So here's a 3D print of it, that then it started to, to kind of st first visualization of the, the actual structure, how it could be built, how it would be engineered, and um, so at the end that all worked. And then, the, of course, the, the same thing with the, with the gondola. Um, while it was engineered, we also created these models to, to just to get a, get a feel for um, the, the, the piece in itself. That brought us to something that we wanted to know more about. Um, the, the whole notion of, of actually making architecture, prefabricating it, and uh, dealing with the kind of limitations that we thought were really in, in, in the kind of housing market um, prevalent and at the same time confronting it, what I meant previously, that if choice is a kind of driving force, why is it that we have actually so little choice when it comes to, to um, housing in itself? And you know, just to kind of give you 
some stats here on the increase of TV channels, running shoes, contact lenses, and this list goes on and on. Um, it's a tremendous explosion of choice that we have within it. But it seems that in architecture itself, there's this, this limitation in which either we have the highly customized project with an incredible budget available, and you know, I would argue that it's actually fairly easy to make fantastic, spectacular architecture if you have $1,000 per square foot available. I think probably with the creative talent in this room here, almost all of us could produce something quite spectacular. But the issue really is we don't have these budgets normally. And uh, you know, the, the, the great customized architecture has been done for, for thousands of years basically now, all the way back to the pyramids. And, but it has always been done at enormous expense. And so, of course, we all know that on the other side, in the industrial age, we had standardization and, and a kind of repetitive structures. And um, but what is what did we have in between the kind of scrutiny of the catalog and trying to be inventive and using elements that were pre-made in a kind of new inventive way? A lot of the architecture of the 70s and 80s have tried that to kind of come up with something in which we, you know, put angles together in a new way and using meshes and so forth. But um, couldn't we produce something, a question that we ask ourselves, couldn't we produce something in which we take advantage of the industrial age, but at the same time bring back this notion of choice? And so when we started to work on, um, on, on, on mass customization ideas uh, back in 99, when we came across this report here from the Federal Reserve Bank in Dallas, where three simple distinctions were made, I think, that, that are very important to understand. Uh, in the agrarian age, we had very low fixed cost and very high marginal costs. Um, so it was very easy for somebody you know, to buy a hammer, and that was very low fixed cost. But then the, the actual manual labor was tremendous, and I think it's not any different than any of the kind of one-off projects that we see today in which uh, the, the, the marginal costs are, are incredibly high, and that's what we're constantly facing when we're trying to develop prototypes and so forth. It's always the first one that is extremely expensive. In the industrial age, we have very high fixed costs because we had to build factories and all the R&D, and then basically through volume, we could produce very low marginal costs. And I would argue that now the opportunity really is to uh, work with ideas where we have both low fixed costs and low marginal costs. If you um, look, for example, like a company like Flextronics or, or, or many others, they, they basically produce now, those are the kind of unsung heroes behind all the big corporations because everything gets farmed out to these kind of very intelligent companies that found ways to manufacture um, many products within one plant. And so there is the possibility by using um, robotics and using um, digital technology overall to get that degree of um, adaptability and customization into the process of all. We're not there yet, but every day more, and I mean, most of you playing around with the CNC machine and so forth, I think one can start to see that the, the kind of possibilities are there. And out of this, we started a, a research project that's ongoing, that always in the summers, we'll, we'll, we'll work a little bit more on it, but it really also spins off a lot of things into the other project that we're trying to build, which is about doing a kind of idea of a prefabricated housing, not just a house, but really an overall approach. And so we looked at ideas of configurations, you may call them user groups. We looked at different design strategies of how to approach this, different marketing strategies, different fabrication ways. And the more we did of this, the more this whole thing expanded into an enormous amount of um, knowledge and so the, we started to structure this a bit more and develop these kind of maps these became these other kind of notations where it's always about the relationship um, that a certain scenario starts to form um, in relationship to the kind of spaces that may emerge from it and then issues from fabrication that would feed into the kind of material properties and how they could meet and those would then also start to work across these lines where some direct feedback from fabrication and our research in material science, how this would actually affect the kind of scenarios again that, that we had there. We started from the outset and saying, we don't want to develop something that would just fit the single or the couple or you know the large family of three generations under one roof or the people that work at home or the people who just sleep there, but rather something, a system that at the end of the day starts to respond to the range of conditions as much as possible. <clears throat> And further, there was an issue of back to the value question. 
we looked at the notion of kind of compactness and one thing we found out that was rather curious uh, by looking at all the developments going on around the world, specifically in Vancouver, um, all the floor plans have been reduced to something extremely standardized, always the same kind of layouts. And the main thing really for people is they have to pay a pretty substantial price these days to build, uh, to buy their units. So in this case here, for example, you'll pay about $600 a square foot if you want to have a, a mountain view, which is still fairly cheap in comparison to many other places of the world. But this, to place this IKEA bookshelf that people shop for, and that's really cheap at $99, the fact is that to place it in your unit, because it occupies two and a half square feet, cost you actually not $99, but $1,460. <clears throat> so we thought, there's actually, once we're looking at this, and once we're thinking about integrating certain issues of lifestyle and so forth into the building itself, there's the possibility to add that value to the, to the development in which one could very well argue that a, that a, a building that is more integrated um, and more customizable from that perspective, the added cost of building features into it. Um, here is kind of the kind of first spatial maps that we created from information access to build in features within a unit um, <clears throat> would actually be totally justified. Part of this is at the same time also, you know, when we deal with housing, we have to deal with the whole issue of zoning and so forth. So the first thing we did is just a quick scenario study of what one could do relating to certain zoning parameters that are actually localized and by comparing different areas of the world, trying to understand how we can extract from this something that actually would become a constant and where then the interest of differentiation or variation could be. Um, and so we moved to this notion of developing a kind of platform or backbone of the building that would hold a lot of the, the things uh, true and then uh, a system that can be added to it that would somehow deal with the variation that would occur in different uh, markets in the world and different uh, social practices. So all these studies, and there are literally hundreds of those, um, related back to this process of developing both the platform, the add-on pieces, and so forth. And one thing was because thought of as a kind of product that can be distributed, um, that we didn't want to have a frame building, but rather that saying that all the elements are basically structural once they come together. And so that created a kind of first map of a very simple house that can be expanded in a number of directions, um, then that you can further customize by adding elements to it, uh, from skylights to uh, patio conditions to highly custom, like highly customizable sidewalls depending on your specific needs, or keep it very simple. <clears throat> and then ran this, um, this particular prototype then through further studies as to what would happen if you confront it into something, a kind of larger urban field in which it becomes uh, townhouses, interlocking things. We actually developed an entire tower out of that system. Um, but here you see just the, the, the kind of townhouse model, coexistences that were developed so that what you would hear, you could actually take over shares from your, from your neighbor and expand and contract as well in this way. So these were all laid out to somehow engage with the kind of multiplicity of, of lifestyles. Um, then we thought, okay, we want to build this, how are we going to do this? And we got a project for uh, a kind of marketing center in which they simply wanted to just have a media wall. And so we said, great, so let's see what we can do with simple techniques, vacuum forming and so forth, um, to develop something that in which we try to find ways to rationalize, to have something which is a completely differentiated landscape where all the curvatures are very different, but then bring it down to as few components as possible uh, and, and rebuild it from there. So at the beginning, we had about 18, then it came down to 10, and the more we worked on this, the more we analyzed the kind of tangent continuities and from one side to another and by flipping and inverting and so forth, at the end, we actually realized that really only needed three pieces. That, and, and with three pieces, I mean, this is already this here, and that one is the same, but then there was the interlock that was actually somehow, that made that whole thing possible between these. So at the end, it was only three pieces, and it became extremely economical. Even, so this was built in 
uh, in Va just outside of Vancouver. This was built in Sandestin, Florida. So here, this now engages with the ceiling condition and it has projectors in it and uh, becomes a kind of canopy to this piece and, and wraps the, 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 the plasma screens that are in there. Um, so it was just one step taken to kind of to see how, what it would mean to kind of customize that feature wall. Is it actually feasible also economically and how can we uh, kind of rationalize the, the approach? <clears throat> I'll get back to this particular issue in a moment. Um, now, switching scales, and you know, I'll just jump you to a number of scales in the next uh, half an hour probably, um, to get a sense of, from, for me, there's really no, no difference between these scales in, in, in some form. We're really just interested in the kind of level of engagement that people can have with it and, and, and preconceptions about um, the architecture itself. This is a competition um, we did uh, in Chile. Um, just outside of Chukicamata, which is the, the biggest uh, copper mine here in the world. And it's a very dry, very hot area. The, the, the desert of Atacama is the driest desert in the world. And so a lot of it had to do, of course, with, with sun protection. But we were asked in this competition brief to design a school for 2,000 students. Um, that would at the same time help to kind of spark the development of an entirely new area. And so we went back and forth in trying to understand how a building that in itself, in its program, in its description of controlling security and all these concerns that they had uh, would at the same time act as a kind of catalyst uh, for development. And so one of the things that we decided to do is basically erase the kind of boundary or territory that a typical building would occupy and saying that the one thing we'll establish is that you can actually always permeate every single public building that they would develop in the city. And we would have to find a way in which some areas that are related to the ground, that are cool spaces in some areas that are controlled by these huge shading devices that are suspended from here would actually make each of these institutions that then at particular moments would would uh, relate to each other and connect and um, other than that all this basically becomes public space in between and so you can see that the the gray grid was given to us from the city and we just say well we're just going to overlay it with the with the red one and then we just establish these network points as these emitters that would somehow start to activate depending on you know, this is the school in this case, and there was supposed to be a, a library and a, and a pool place and a city hall and so forth. So this is the old city of Kalama, and that's the expansion towards the airport down here. And then the different areas that we're asking for, from industrial manufacturing to very dense, small-scale housing and so forth. And so this is how we looked at this, trying to develop this further by actually developing the building. So that became that kind of territory of the in-between space that where all kinds of things could start to happen depending on how active the school was or if it was weekend or weekday. And we're starting to kind of map out and, and understand what the relationship between these kind of different cultural practices would be. And again, we just invented our own way of drawing these different activities and trying to find ways to translate them into the actual spaces. At the same time, we had to deal with the pragmatics and the sun studies um, that needed to be dealt with. And so overlaying these two then gave us a first very simple spatial diagram of where things would be uh, or could be related. Um, so you see this, this is the kind of lower space and then the, these upper bars floating through it. And again, this is not a building, this is a, this is a diagram. This is really just thought to further develop the, the, the panels up on top that would regulate, depending on the programs below, how light and air would flow and uh, some solar panels in there and so forth, being the generator for the building. And then we took this model and basically started to cut it apart and become very localized in some of the analysis that we've done. It basically just went section by section through this project and looked at where are these moments of connection that were important where is the possibility, where is possibly for certain event fields, the sport fields, um, you know, the larger gyms and how they would all relate back to ideas, educational models and so forth. And then that was the final 
the final model that was really all about this kind of continuous landscape. Here's the parking and the park. So this was the idea. This is a, this, there are the green strips, parks that run right through the middle of the school, and you slip your car under there. You just drive down these slots and park right below these. And then this is the, the main gym. That's the central library. That's the kindergarten. Uh, and that's a secondary gym in here, and that's the amphitheater and so forth. And then you have these bars basically hanging from this structure that does the, the solar control in here and create ex mass exchange. And here really what we're interested in is really create this kind of interpretive capacity where it's really not defined what these territories would be. We just played a number of games on those to see what could happen with them and if it would actually work if somebody would decide to do so. Very similar, and I'll, I'll keep this quick here. Um, a project we were asked um, did a number of projects in China in, in the in the last few years. Um, that competition we didn't win, by the way. Um, this here is a new town just outside of Beijing, and um, <clears throat> for 5,000 people, and they were asking us to create a monument at the entry and a couple of bridges and a pier, and so we said we don't want to create a monument. Like, if, if there's a great monument, then it's really just somehow a kind of event field, something in which things can happen that actually relate back to the culture. Went to Beijing, talked to them, and realized that the one thing that the Chinese really love is the kind of marketplaces and places of exchange. They love book fairs and uh, all kinds of things where they actually really install themselves on a very temporal basis, and so we, we started we really started to like this this notion and engaging with it and said, why don't we create something instead of a monument, we create a kind of a, a lighting field that's an infrastructure for uh, those kind of things that could emerge and then develop a language when each bridge becomes a kind of vantage point from where you actually start to understand the new development and that's where people would really gather. So all we proposed that all the kind of public plazas to be actually the bridges in some form or another. And so that's the separation, that's what we call the kind of three-finger bridge, so two lanes in and out into the village, that's the main entry, that's the lighting field that you would actually see from the highway here. So these, the, the tops of these posts are high enough. Um, that's that one plaza here. That's the bridge on the side. Here again, that's the, the bridge with the deck and then relating it back to the, to the water. And then we, <coughs> actually this was all flat, so we just used the, we argued that the excavation that would have to be done for the buildings, we would be glad to accept it and build these berms everywhere to basically create uh, kind of land art slash seating and so forth that, that also would shield it somehow from the highway itself. Um, you can see it's very simple how this starts to, is the parking road cutting through here. That's the terrace berms that would allow to activate this here for concerts or events in some form. Um, then the bridge itself. And then the main bridge, they wanted to have a suspension bridge, which was ridiculous for the, the kind of village. So we actually said the main bridge, that they, their feature bridge should again be more about these kind of platforms that would fold out and somehow much more about the kind of materiality, how it would respond to the kind of conditions there of lighting and so forth and develop this uh, bridge um, as one or further variation where this only happens on one side. So they, again, they can install you know, a little local book fair on this thing or whatever they want, want to do with this, but a moment of pause where you relate back and have the vantage point of the, the, the visual connection through the village itself. And then the last thing was this pier um, that had to be done in three different scenarios, either by itself, with the beach club on it, or with the sail club on it, or, or all of the above. Um, because they wouldn't know how much money they would have and if the sail club would ever happen, sailing club would ever happen. And so it had to be designed to, to do all these things at once. But the one thing that we're interested in was somehow carrying up the city on top of this thing and create a relationship back uh, to, the, to the city itself. Now that project was actually approved and ready to be built until uh, we were struck by SARS and uh, the whole government, uh, the whole Chinese management ran away for three, three months, took their families to Australia and Canada, wherever, and it never recovered from it, unfortunately. But this one did. 
Um, that's also this is in, this is in Beijing, um, and we're there. We were asked again to build this two-phase project. Um, first phase, it was supposed to be a sales center for a new city, and uh, in which they show show suites on the other side have actually the sales activity. But then they wanted to move it into the park and turn it into a museum and a tea house. So we had to take that into consideration um, how to develop it and design it, and um, the whole notion here was to basically create these prefabricated buildings that in which everything that would happen in there would relate back to some of the scenarios that we uh, that we looked at um, and then find a kind of systematic approach for this to be built fairly quickly, disassembled, put on the back of a truck and reassembled in a different location in which even the configuration of these two buildings to each other um, had to change. And this is now under construction, so this should be done in a, about a month from now. That's the, the main entry here, and then here's some of the what carried over from, from projects that we've done previously, that these are actually fairly deep steps, so these are inhabitable, so once this is activated as a tea house, you can actually sit out here, and this, this becomes the main space along which these two, the, the gallery and the tea house itself, would communicate. And then there's the kind of continuous circulation that engages the, the programs with each other where possible. Okay, um, the, this project, the next project that's actually called, um, gave us then further opportunity to look at this whole issue with uh, prefabrication and, and mass customization. Uh, next is a series of exhibitions on emerging artists from the Pacific Rim curated by the Vancouver Art Gallery. The project follows an invitation by the Art Gallery not only for an exhibition of our work, but specifically to develop a new prototype gallery space that will complement and accommodate the complexities of new media, as they say, I quote here, new media artworks produced today and yet will be unique and distinguishable from the architecture that defines the other galleries. Uh, in response, the project we developed uh, had three interrelated issues. Designing a strategy for a curatorial process, we wanted to somehow return this invitation to them and saying, we're not giving you a solution, we'll give you a kind of set of tools that you can actually start to work with. Um, dealing with the notion of incompleteness to stimulate a kind of interpretive, interpretive interaction and removing architecture somehow or the gallery idea from the kind of white box and neutral condition that it normally has. And last, creating a kind of prototyping and fabrication process and assemblies that allow for a multiplicity of implementations and unexpected, unexpected, unexpected perceptions using the idea of mass customization. So first in response to the given task, we decided to create a design proposal that would be an invitation in itself, rather than generating one form that would condition any future art exhibition, we developed a design and fabrication strategy that will allow curators and artists together to condition the form itself. Obviously, the project, the project critiques the traditional notion of the authorship or the author, which typically generates entirely fixed and closed propositions. We called it internally the 1,000 galleries uh, that instead uh, developed a system that much closer resembles the nature of new, me new media art today ongoing invention and interactivity. So we try to de deploy this idea of incompleteness and saying we, we remove and we're creating these spaces that we're creating a kind of system that, that the artist and the curator in discussion would basically be challenged to develop um, their notion of what it really means to, to have a space appropriate to the discussion. And so this was one out of many kind of brainstorming pages that in which we're trying to see what are the, all the issues, how do they relate to each other, and how can we uh, start to make sense uh, from this here. Through the elimination of hierarchies between artwork and viewer, floor and ceiling and walls, each potential configuration was supposed to create a field of adaptation, unfolding, and potentiality. In summary, the strategy was to invite inventiveness in varying degrees of affect, participation, and perception. Scenario planning was to be, was to be conducted in parallel with rapid prototyping. 
So here you see a first model in which we said that the, the, the project had to have the capacity somehow to be transformed from a very horizontal landscape condition into something entirely vertical in, in, in nature and uh, depending on something in which you actually deal either with kind of new media and sculpture and so forth or sound or sound locks and, 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 and parabolic speaker systems all the way to uh, projection chambers. And so one, the, the, the one that we decided from these studies that we would build uh, was this one here. The, and this was really just one out of a thousand, but that seems to fit the best with our own work, which we were also supposed to show there. And so while I'm showing this right now, you should really look at this as really as one out of many. Seems strangely distorted, this image. Um, here you can see then what we basically did in all of this is go through it and see again how we could find a way to actually build the kind of formal complexity and spatial complexity that we're interested in and, and, and rationalize this. And so similar to some of the projects that I've shown before, we realized pretty quickly at the beginning these were all, all over and had all kinds of variation to it, but realized that a lot of this was actually unnecessary and that we could identify by by identifying just simple different connectors, we could actually produce an incredible amount of variation in the space itself. And so a lot of these could be prefabricated, completely standardized as these pallets of this lattice, and then a number of the specific ones, we could then use a, a CNC machine to actually build them. So this is the, the space that we then build. obviously the CNC machine that then started to produce these elements in a very simple fashion, you know, very rational in a way. And I know that, of course, our long-term goal is to make these things also to challenge the question of the, the kind of modularity that is still implied, but we're actually quite happy that you could at the end not read the, any of the modules. The modules didn't matter, really. It was more the continuity that matters, and that seemed to work the longer we worked on the project itself. Um, the second layer in this was to think about how uh, the materials in it um, would actually be able to perform a number of functions from lighting devices to floors to particular embed furnitures and so forth and so we developed a, a kind of four different types of corrugations that we can then use um, to control anything from building the floors to uh, uh, furniture, uh, slip resistance on, on flat floors and, and so forth and use the machine. So here's a kind of lounge chair that is there but it's flat folded and the fact that it is corrugated actually allows us to, after the vacuum forming, to bend it into a number of different shapes. So it's not just this, in this chair again are probably ten chairs implied and you can build it and you can vacuum form it from here to the end or the whole thing, that's up to you. Um, so, you know, this is a kind of super mold that we called it that would still work very well as a chair from here to there or all the way or just from here to there. So there's, again, a kind of superimposition of a number of scenarios in the one thing. And then, of course, the vacuum forming itself. What is interesting about this was really that we used the CNC machine to mill in the path uh, as a remainder, which actually creates a kind of micro corrugation, which um, added an incredible amount of strength to the to the material. This is just uh, PETG plastic, um, but after having the the corrugation running this way and then the micro corrugation this way, uh, something that was only uh, three eighths of an inch thick was actually strong enough to have me bouncing on it with 250 pounds, no problem. And then it also created, of course fantastic effects. Like, it's not that we're uninterested in effects. Uh, it's just a question of what comes first and what comes last. Um, but the way that it allowed us to control the light and make people in this particular space of an art gallery actually give them a very different consciousness of themselves navigating over these floors. Um, here's a, here you see the floors that were actually built into this. Um, having these corrugations together with the top sheet of this uh, then riveted together, made a very, very strong floor in itself that could do more than just a typical deck or decking system. And here you can see the, some of which the floor was actually made out of mesh, some was made out of the, the, the finer corrugation, and here you see that we just 
took a flat sheet and basically just milled a path into it so that in the extrusion you would just get a slip resistance into, on, into the plastic itself so people wouldn't fall. And then this is the space at the end. Um, here the, the kind of lounge chairs that integrate themselves into the landscape. On the top we have lighting and projection and so forth. From there, <clears throat> we moved into a, a project where we were asked by a church um, in Vancouver to design their space, and they've just bought an old factory. Well, we, nobody really knows what it was. We had a factory warehouse building, um, and said, please design the space for us, and then we looked into trying to understand how we could actually produce some kind of add-on value to them, and in a way, this this became the most important document in the whole project where we just simply mapped out when the church was actually active and everything that's white here is when they're non-active. So we said instead of designing a church, asking them how they would actually operate culturally and so forth and how much they care about the space of being a space of representation or if we could strip it of the notion of representation if you could actually use the space in a number of different ways and they said that would be just fine so then they agreed that we can actually design this so that the church could operate but they could also rent the space out for performing uh, performances for um, any kind of festivities and so forth and that's then what we actually used to plan this structure in here in which basically we mapped onto this this end result of these shapes here is really just a kind of remapping of being able to rent out this by itself or this or the whole thing or just parts of it and so forth and give them a kind of economic viability in the in the project itself which then which was great for us actually increased the budget more and more because they they started to talk to the schools and community centers and everybody was excited about it nobody had enough space and so they came back and said sure we will rent from you we will pay you this much per weekend and so forth and that actually allowed us to increase the budget and um, then took some of the notions to that we had learned from the previous project to kind of install these different scenarios in this case here is this kind of uh, lattice on top that's the infrastructure for lighting um, this is the, yeah, again, one of the most important things is actually in a wall, which is the kind of light switch board that has all these different scenarios planned into it. And then the, the body that's basically inserted here with the wraps on itself that has all the stage being part of this. And then depending on the scenarios, all this picks up all the different directions. So no matter which way you would actually operate it, somehow this spatially always relates back to the, the scenarios implied. And so you have this kind of thick space of infrastructure on top and bottom and then this body floating in there and that's currently under construction as well. And the last project I'm going to show today is maybe our most important project today because it's simply the biggest uh, and it had the, the greatest challenges to somehow take a lot of these notions and try to see how we can bring them into a building um, in a situation that really was tremendously challenging throughout um, from the, the whole planning process and the kind of political realities that this project was surrounded by. Um, one of which is downtown well, Vancouver itself. This is downtown Vancouver. Um, used to be just a little sawmill down here, very low buildings just 25 years ago. This is what the city is now. And uh, there are about 33 towers under construction right now. And the downtown population has increased from 40,000 to 120,000 just over uh, a decade. And so there's an enormous amount of activity going on and, and demographic shift where a lot of people that love the suburban dream of the Canadian house, they're all moving uh, back into the city and they want to live in these towers. And um, that created the kind of framework and condition for one of the projects that we did, um, the frenzy that comes with this is just incredible right now. Um, any of these towers that are marketed um, just last week, 
there was uh, another three towers that came onto the market and people lined up at two o'clock in the morning and by eight o'clock when the sales center opened for the first time there were about 800 people and 400 units were sold within the first hour and uh, so there's this kind of whole migration going on in the city where people want to have they want to live downtown again and um, <clears throat> so when we were asked to design a project this is downtown, that's the peninsula here, that's all the water, so forth. This is a huge park here, Stanley Park. Our project was over here, but still very much affected though, because really the, the kind of booming strip is all of this. You know, the University of British Columbia is over here, the campus, and they actually, most of the buildings over here, they've become a developer in themselves now. And all of this basically is just really a kind of frenzy of development. And we were here, but the little red dots here is a particular zoning district that is one of the most challenging because all this is white here is pretty much single family houses. So you, you, you fall into a position where uh, any strategy has to be incredibly responsive to, to the kind of changing nature and at the same time we were working on this project the whole zoning bylaws were completely rewritten and revised and um, let's just show you up in the hill here's the ocean. So we had to find a model that would, would work um, politically, that would still allow us to embed a lot of the ideas that we're interested in, and um, that we could show to our client again. We, could show, we had to be able to show them the, 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 the added value by not just building the pragmatic box, which is, this is the typical apartment, right? It's, it's normally, you're surrounded by five sides, you have a little bit of window in the front, bedrooms, living rooms, everything has to somehow find its way here, a lot of dark areas in the back, highly standardized floor plans, and we said, well, we want to be able to give people an indoor-outdoor relationship, we want to give them double-story spaces, but most importantly, we want to accommodate different lifestyles, so this goes very much back to the uh, the pack house project, the prefab project, the prefab house project, where we wanted to basically uh, have these ten suites that we were supposed to design done in a way that at the end of the day you could you would not have a single unit being the same in it and have this kind of differentiation and possibilities for people to go in read the space and install themselves in their very own fashion in it and um, so what we did in response was twofold well, a we devised a strategy of research and marketing research where we could actually demonstrate to our client that there's a market for this that didn't exist previously. And the second one, to, to devise a strategy for the building where um, we introduced a kind of fixed backbones, which are these white lines, and then these gray areas that we just called the kind of very flexible, malleable space, and that you know, come, came back from the kind of idea of platform design and add-ons and so forth. Um, and so that created these kind of mediating slot spaces that are these exterior patios but they could expand and contract and so forth and then the side partitions of these things that um, contain most of the infrastructure and we also didn't want to design them just as, as condos where you split up floor plates but we actually designed them from the individual units up so we said you know the Canadian dream is that people still want to have their house but then they want to live in a dense urban fabric and so we basically designed them these studios um, that then had, as I said, 10 different floor plans and could be varied through a whole range of scenarios. And so you see that basically always three sides of glass, the mediating space, um, the, the bridge space that relates and allowed us to actually push back of bedrooms back into the rear, liberating the front. And normally you will have a, a, a bedroom in the front to have daylight access and ventilation access, but this slot allowed us to push them to the rear and therefore have a lot more flexibility in the front for a home office or living, entertaining, gallery space. And then this started to perforate the building everywhere and to kind of let uh, light through, create kind of connections between the, the, the various elements. Here you can see this. So everywhere you basically have these kind of see-through connectors and the, the possibilities. You can entirely slide these side faces open here so that your, your everyday can just be contained or expand into this space, you take it over in whatever fashion you like. And then it's literally just, you know, the, the, the outer skin is just zoning bylaws that are applied here and, and uh, 
mediated with the city over a year of what the setbacks have to be and so forth. So there's not that much design in all of this. And then this, this the, the bottom and all these wrappers simply deal with <coughs> defining the, the, the spaces in a way that at the end, the variation of all of these can be synthesized and then they, they can all coexist in the same building. <coughs> so some of these interior patio spaces that you can slide open in here and then the, the individual units and then here a typical layout of a unit but then it was designed right away that you can actually turn this into home office sleeping be there with the family or as a single however you like you know that none of these were actually designed in which there's only one position for your TV or the typical design that you would find but they rather uh, are designed to have the capacity to take on numerous configurations so that there was a whole again scenario planning done on these to find out what are the actual kind of shapes and, and layouts that would make this possible. And then we had to rationalize it back and find construction methods that uh, would allow us to, uh, to build these in a very simple way. So we've, we've, we found and then customized a, a system from England that's called Confloor, which is actually quite fantastic uh, in the way how you can link it and cut it. And, uh, and it has a lot of redundancy built into it and therefore that together with some custom or customized concrete pieces actually allowed us to have all these different configurations and patios on top of living spaces and so forth and um, so this dialogue between the actual design and, and, and the way of building this even though you know there's no CNC machine involved in this there's an incredible amount of customization in it but it was only possible through rationalizing these systems learning the lessons from the <coughs> from the previous projects that we had done. So this will be built now at about uh, 150 Canadian dollars a square foot, which is, I think, really quite cheap. So you can see always the units, how they are actually interlocking, coexisting, and then by themselves there. And there's one more video of the whole project. So the whole front is, uh, is a stainless steel mesh green that's all adjustable. So every, every unit owner can basically, they can move them and slide them however they want. And that creates these different positions. So again, this, this is really not, you know, kind of, you know, of course, not a photorealistic rendering. We're not at all interested in that, really. This is a, a design development document that was used to talk to, this was shown to the city, just to make them understand what the building actually is. It was passed on to the engineers and the consultants so that they can understand spatially and conceptually what was going on and what we were trying to accomplish. And those were actually very, very helpful, instrumental the whole time to get everybody on board and then we brought the trades in and showed them these things and you know this, the, it, it, it got them excited about the project and at the same time it allowed us to not just draw up the project, send it out and uh, then have a lot of surprises. We had, we invited, and this is something that we developed from the first project we did in Chile, we always invite the trades from the very first day we're developing a project and we're basically detailing the projects with their input 
by visiting their shops and understanding how they actually build and what their capacity is and then we challenge them on their territory as much as possible um, and so we need to have these visualizations but if they flicker a bit or so that doesn't really matter so we don't spend too much time making them sleek we really spend most of the time to just use them to communicate what what is important and then these get continuously updated uh, to kind of bring in the, the, the overall design development. So just a, a few pictures. Um, this was really, this was made to convince the neighbors in the back that this building is actually not as massive and uh, solid, but that it's actually very light and translucent. And it allowed us at the end to win the support of the adjacent neighbors just because they started to understand that they could see through and that it would, you know, that uh, the, the presence of it is, is quite varied. That's the internal patio. That's uh, all the stairs are freestanding and so that's why the walls are actually quite solid because they're firewalls but then we perforated all the firewalls with a certain percentage that was given to us from the city and from the engineer and so forth. They're also the sheer walls so everybody hated of course the idea to put in these slots but at the end we could by mediating this maximum percentage of 38. This is how it sits in the context and that's the uh, front elevation. An informed architecture, I would argue, conceived in an open-ended, inclusive, and non-hierarchical way and developed in a co-evolutionary process of differentiation, including design intelligence, may generate multiplicities of new conditions and relationships. Rather than proposing direct formal translations that in the culture of change become obsolete before they have been implemented, an architecture based on design intelligence that is involved in all phases and involved in multiplicities within the process of difference, um, <clears throat> within the process of difference, uh, may allow us to rethink our current position and practice. An architecture conceived in an open-ended, inclusive, and a co-evolutionary process of differentiation and inquiry based on design intelligence may avoid the obsolescence of either the conceptual and stylized propositions on the one hand or the superficial pragmatism on the other. Instead, it may engage with the true multiplicities of cultural practice in the broadest of sense. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay. Thank you.